Chapter 14 Frankenstein's Monster In late summer 1984, as part of the Church's strategy to fund ongoing litigation, of which there was much at the time, someone came up with the idea of forming the International Association of Scientologists, IAS, a membership organization that all Scientologists had to join to receive Church services. Several years earlier, after the FBI raided the church, and numerous staff, including Mary Sue Hubbard, were facing prison terms, the church had established a legal defense fund that brought in a considerable amount of money. The new idea behind IAS was to repackage that fund to create a new source of income. Attorneys explained how it could be set up offshore to put it beyond the reach of the IRS or an agency of any government. Six weeks later in October, church leaders, including David, gathered at St. Hill to sign a pledge to mankind to support the aims of Scientology. The event, which signified the formation of the IAS, was videotaped and then played to Scientologists all over the world. The video proved hugely popular, but it marked the birth of a Frankenstein's monster. That first event soon spawned others— a New Year's celebration, an LRH birthday celebration, a May 9th Dianetics anniversary, a week-long Free Winds Maiden Voyage anniversary celebration, an Auditor's Day celebration, and coming full circle, an IAS celebration every October. As time went on, another event held at the Church's Celebrity Center in Hollywood, a study center and hotel for stars, was added to the roster. Year after year, these events became more lavish, with elaborate stage decorations, specially produced videos to announce the latest church accomplishment or product for sale, graphic effects to highlight church expansion, all intended to increase the impact of speeches that church executives, and increasingly David himself, delivered by teleprompter. To prepare for the productions, people were pulled away from their usual duties and sucked into frantic, event-related activities. The shows became base-wide nightmares, although I must admit they did accomplish the only effect David truly wanted. Scientology audiences deeply impressed with Scientology's ever-widening impact on society under his leadership. The events became showcases for such things as Scientology's disaster relief efforts, its anti-drug campaigns, and its continual push, as spearheaded by David, to make a better world through the works of L. Ron Hubbard. The reality is, however, that these extravaganzas were Scientology's Potemkin villages. Just as Russian military leader Grigory Potemkin built fake villages to impress Catherine the Great during a tour of Crimea, David erected hollow facades of Scientology expansion and good works to amaze Scientologists. Many, if not most, of the nifty programs, for example, a new broadcast television advertising campaign that will reach billions with the message of Scientology, announced at events, were never completed. The busy churches around the world, featured in specially prepared videos, were filled with parishioners who had been press-ganged into creating the appearance of a hive of activity, which disappeared the minute the video crew left town. The agenda behind these events became plain after some time. They were more to cement David's position as leader of the church than to highlight any accomplishment of Scientology itself. In recent years, both aspects have become blurred entirely. Each evolution of an event was stressful for David, and his frustration levels ratcheted up as deadlines for completion of various aspects of the production came and went. For him, however, the night of the show always provided a big payoff in terms of ego boost when adoring audiences showered him with thundering ovations. As the years rolled on, the reward for anybody working on an event was simply a night's sleep. Preparation for an event involved nearly the entire base population of several hundred for weeks and weeks, often around the clock. Pulling off one of these events requires a tremendous amount of work. Management executives have to plan the event. Researchers need to gather the news and information needed for the speechwriters who must write the speeches and scripts for videos to be shown at the event. 
Compilations people have to prepare the books, courses, or materials to be presented. The film and video department must shoot the required videos and prepare the graphics shown during the event. The editing department has to edit everything. The musicians must compose, record, and mix all the music. Construction crews have to build the ornate stage decorations. Logistics personnel need to pack up and transport everything to the venue, usually in Los Angeles, Clearwater, St. Hill, or on the free winds. Marketing people must prepare promotional materials. Executives in charge of various sectors of the Scientology network have to write programs that their people at lower echelons must execute for the event, and base support personnel must perform all their usual services, but on wildly extended schedules. David directly manages virtually every aspect of these activities. He stirs the soup, and nothing advances to the next stage until he gives his approval. When I was involved, the usual result, which I am sure continues to this day, was that several months of production had to be compressed into a few weeks. The stress level at these times is hard to describe. Almost without exception, David was unhappy with the initial planning, speeches, videos, editing, music, or the promotion— he gave no thought to deadlines, or to how each step of the work depended on previous steps by other units. The musicians, for instance, could not begin their job until David had approved the video edits. In the music department, we would do as much as we could beforehand, but mostly we had to mark time until David gave his final blessing, which was usually just days before the show. Then it would be a total madhouse, day and night, until we were done, and everything was... In the can, the relief throughout the base was palpable because people couldn't wait to fall into bed. I haven't looked up the word micromanagement in a dictionary recently, but I am convinced that if I did, I would find David's picture next to the definition. He micromanaged every aspect of every event, often complaining loudly that he had to do it because everyone else working on the event was incompetent. Music was an integral part of each show from opening themes to music that accompanied videos and sometimes live performances, particularly aboard the Free Winds, which had a week of nightly events each June. The entire international base at Gold revolved around these events. One event ended and preparations for the next began. The music department suffered this nightmare seven times a year. Remember, we had to wait until the videos were okayed. The usual routine was that the people working on the videos stayed awake around the clock, shooting and reshooting, editing and re-editing these videos to the last minute. When the final edit came to us, we had no time to do the music. It went on like this for nearly every single event. And that's no exaggeration. We were up day and night scoring, recording, mixing, and then seeking approval from David's office. For the Free Winds Cruises, we also prepared different shows for most nights of the voyage— Unless you have worked on an event in the Sea Org at Gold, you haven't lived. Let me correct that. You haven't lived a nightmare. Often, the stress levels ratcheted up even higher, thanks to various executives who had adopted David's methods of dealing with people. You could call it the monkey-see-monkey-do theory of executive training. It wasn't everybody who behaved like that, but those who eschewed that sort of behavior did not last too long, as I remember. One executive who did adopt David's management style often dealt with the music area. He has long since tired of David and is no longer in the Sea Org. While he was there and having to answer to David, though, he mimicked some of David's people-handling tactics. One time this executive came into the music area to check on the progress of a piece we were working on. Peter Schles and I were at the keyboard when the executive walked in with an arrogant sneer on his face and said, Boy, you guys are really something. I could go upstairs on my shitty little keyboard, and 20 minutes later I could give you a piece that would blow away the shit that you guys do. Fah. <laughs> and walked out of the room in disgust. So, added to the compressed deadlines to get something done, on top of little or no sleep, we had to deal with stuff like that. And this was going on all over the base, as each area was working on its own part of the event. This executive later demonstrated to all of us in music that his arrogance about his knowledge of music was nothing more than a facade. 
He prided himself on having acute listening skills that could determine what was right and what was wrong with a piece of music or a mix. His confidence in his ability in this area was supreme. One day, he was supervising us as we did a mix. He stood there listening intently, rubbing his chin wisely. A technician sat at the equalizer, a machine you can use to strengthen or weaken the sound frequencies at specific points. The idea is to get a good balance of all the low notes and high notes, so everything blends together pleasantly, and an equalizer helps you do that. Give me one more tick at 250, he said knowingly. That meant he wanted to slightly raise the volume at 250 vibrations a second. The technician did so. Okay, give me a tick at 5K, he said by which he meant the technician should make the sound level at 5,000 vibrations a little louder. He listened a little longer. Okay, take off the tick at 250. He listened a little longer. Okay, perfect. It's approved, he announced, and walked out, secure in his place in the universe, shoulders back and head held high. Well, good. Glad that is done, we all thought, as we began to note down the settings that were part of the record-keeping protocol for any piece of music. Only then did we notice that the equalizer had not been turned on. Talk about the Emperor's new clothes. We had a real good laugh at his expense and adjusted our attitudes toward him forever. Among all this misery, what kept us there was our goal to make the world a better place and help mankind. The pressures and the punishment-driven management methods only blunted people's resolve, and their use became more frequent as time went on. Of course, no one who considers joining the Sea Org is ever told what happens after you sign your billion-year contract. Can you imagine someone joining the Sea Org, or go to gold as I did and being told the truth by their recruiter? Okay, you've decided to join the Sea Org. Congratulations and welcome. We're glad to have you as part of the team. Now, uh, chances are you aren't going to get any time for study or Scientology services or to do anything other than your job, because that's all that counts. You're going to get substandard food. The galley crew will do its best to prepare it in a way that is palatable and somewhat nutritious. But at one point, the food allocation for a gold staff member will be $3 per person per day. Your incoming mail will be opened and read before you get it. The mail you send out will be read before it goes out. Any phone call you make will be monitored by a person listening on an extension. You will not be allowed to leave the base to go shopping at a store. If you have to see a doctor, you must have an escort. In other words, a guard. So you don't leave. Your everyday activity will be monitored minutely, and there will come a point where you will not have had a regular day off for years. This is how your life will be from this day forward. Sign here. It wasn't like that when I joined the Sea Org. How does it get to that point? By tiny increments. A small change here, a small change there, a slight modification of a rule here, another one there. You agree to each one because it seems like no great loss of liberty or freedom of movement or of thought. It is for the greater good, you rationalize. The next thing you know, you can't even go into town to buy Christmas presents to mail to the family you have not seen in ten years. That's how you arrive in the position I just described. How you get any group of people, a small group, a large group, a whole country, to become trapped is by their own state of mind and their own consent to be trapped. They have to be willing to be there and be trapped. Look, the explanation begins, there are people off the base causing us trouble, so we need to start checking all the letters that go out. It's for your own good and the safety of the base. I'll tell you how this started. Around 1990, the marketing people had phones they could use to call vendors who produced the avalanche of promotion the church was sending out. One guy was using the phones to talk to his mother nearly every day and telling her about what was happening on the base, particularly as related to Tom Cruise, who was there with Nicole Kidman. Both were doing courses and auditing at the base, the guy's mother was passing the information on to the National Enquirer, and you can imagine the explosion when that came to light. Afterward, everybody had to request written authorization to call his or her family. 
Once that was granted, you could make your call, but somebody was always on an extension in another office eavesdropping on everything being said. One Christmas, Becky called her mother, who had been violently ill with the flu. She went on and on about her misery, all while one of the security personnel listened in. Can you imagine how mortified she would have been if she knew? Of course, the staff member placing the call cannot let on that this is happening, but you can imagine the strain it placed on the conversation. Ever since 1990, every time a gold-based staff member calls their family, that is what happens. That is the solution put in place to solve the problem of someone's feeding celebrity information to his mother long ago. That solution has caused so many more problems that it's ridiculous. Personal mail brought another invasion of a staff member's privacy. You would write a letter to a family member or friend, address the envelope, and put a stamp on it, but leave the envelope unsealed. You would place it in the mail station in your work area, where each person in that building had a basket for incoming mail, memos, magazines, and the like. The mail runner would collect any outgoing letters and send them on to the security department, where a member of the security force would read the letter. If the letter was deemed okay, the envelope was sealed and sent out to be mailed. If it wasn't okay, if the security person objected to something you had written, the letter came back to you to fix before it could go out. During World War II, the government checked mail to ensure sensitive operations were not being compromised. That was exactly the mentality at the gold base, yet the only enemies on the horizon were in somebody's mind. The irony is that Scientology loudly trumpets its support of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. However, every staff member at the base was forced to sign away their rights to privacy. This really got to Becky because, working in marketing, she took part in creating church promotional magazines that contained the Declaration and special issues every year. She once made a crack about the hypocrisy of the situation to her senior manager in marketing— and it created a brouhaha with a senior executive dressing her down in front of another group of executives and other staff, which, as it happened, included me. That's how the craziness starts. People will respond to an authority figure. If someone has authority, people tend to listen to that person. Not just the Germans listening to Hitler, but anybody listening to someone higher in the pecking order. So you agree to go to a muster four times a day something you would never do if left to your own devices. You agree to have someone check your room to make sure it is clean. You agree to have your mail checked. You agree to have someone listen on an extension when you phone a family member. You agree to stay in an enclosed compound and not go to a store. At the base, control was exerted over what a person could write and say, and this mania even extended to an attempt to control what a person had witnessed. Here is how that came about. In the mid-1980s, Hubbard developed something he called the Truth Rundown in response to a comment a staff member had made on a survey. The gist of the comment was that Hubbard was difficult to work with on the set during the year he spent making technical training films. The person had been there for that whole year and experienced Hubbard's numerous blow-ups when things did not go according to his demands and the writer expressed this in answering the survey. Hubbard's response was to theorize that the man's observations were most likely a justification of or cover-up for harmful actions by the person himself. According to Hubbard, such criticisms of a well-intentioned person usually are found to be false or merely hearsay. The remedy was to take the individual into an auditing session and begin tracing his harmful actions and bring them to light, now here is where it gets creepy. The goal of this activity was to convince the person that what he thought he had seen, with his own eyes, mind you, was not what he actually had seen, but merely his rationalization for his own less-than-stellar behavior. In other words, the perfect outcome of the truth rundown would be for someone to disavow what he or she had witnessed. Hubbard also wrote that the person should offer to address the group and, in an act of contrition, apologize for spreading false and misleading information about so-and-so, and say, in essence, it was just my own nasty secrets that made me say these things. 
To me, this sounded a lot like the Manchurian candidate, though I will add that I cannot recall the rundowns ever achieving the successful outcome that Hubbard envisioned. People observe what they observe, and what I observed were increasing restrictions on my freedoms of thought and expression. I once tried out my theory of incremental concessions with a taxi driver. Peter Schles and I were taking a taxi to a gig site in Mexico, where we docked during a maiden voyage anniversary cruise. I asked the driver, Have you ever heard of the pyramids of Chichen Itza? Oh, yes, very famous. I know them well, he replied. I wonder how they got there, I said. I don't know, he answered. You know, I heard that even with modern-day technology, you couldn't move stones that big, I said. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what I heard, I continued. Well, it's possible that that is true, he agreed. I got him to agree to that one point. After continuing to get a slight agreement here and a slight agreement there, we arrived at the gig site. And I asked the driver, okay then, who built the pyramids at Chichen Itza? People from outer space, he replied. I had proved to myself that my theory worked, and I had a witness. Peter laughed his ass off when we got out of the taxi. That is a humorous example, but life in the Sea Org was not a joke. At one point in the early 2000s, I told Becky, I cannot go on living like this. She agreed. As we were walking to lunch one day, I said to one of the guys in the music area, I have no intention of living the rest of my life like this. He turned to me and said, Ronnie, why don't you tell C.O.B.? Do you ever talk to him? Tell him how bad it is. A lot of good that would have done. David was the one who made it that way. In the Marines, when you are down in the trenches and everything is going to hell around you, you don't look sideways. You look up the chain of command. Because of that, I knew that David was responsible. Yet his recognition of his responsibility for creating the terrible conditions at the base was exactly zero. I offer this example. One day I was talking with Mark Yeager, one of the top church executives for many years, and thus one of David's favorite punching bags. At one point, Mark mentioned to me that he had remarked to David, Some people in gold have not had a liberty in twelve years. According to Mark, David's response was utter surprise. That's insane! he said, thereby pretending that he had no hand in it, while being the sole creator of the arbitrary rules that led to the conditions where people could go for that long without a day off. David had closely aligned himself with L. Ron Hubbard. When L.R.H. died, some people thought that Hubbard had appointed David as his successor, which I am certain is not true. Here is why I think so. Throughout his life, Hubbard wrote down nearly everything in longhand, including the vast majority of the thousands of church policies and technical bulletins he wrote. He even wrote whole books in longhand. He recorded thousands of public lectures and thousands more briefings of executives. He kept a small cassette recorder next to his bed in case an idea came to him in the middle of the night. Yet he said not a word about arguably the most important decision of his life, who should carry on his life's work? My opinion is that Hubbard left no plan for succession. Here was a man who wrote everything down. He couldn't have scrawled a note on his deathbed that said, I hereby appoint David Miscavige as my successor? During his time in the Sea Org, however, David had wormed his way into a position that made him the gatekeeper for communications to and from Hubbard. That gave David immense authority. Because he had that authority, people would listen to him, which is another definition of power, something David told me as well as others. Power is when people will listen to you, as he put it. Knowing this, he used that authority to make people do things they would not normally do. In the Sea Org, people assume that any orders come from COB, so they follow them. It is that simple. I saw him ruthlessly take people apart with a withering glare and high-decibel, profanity-laced accusations. You did not want to cross him. His modus operandi was domination through nullification. You might walk into another area of the org, say, editing, and there he would be, ripping somebody apart. A different area on another day, same thing. You were glad it was not happening to you. 
A corporate management style, popular up until the 1980s, was the tough boss who yells at employees. It has long since gone out of favor, but it is the palest approximation of the way David has run the church since he took over. Every staff member was, more often than not, in a rattled condition all of the time. The facility at Gold had a large CD production plant, built at great expense, just as CDs were being replaced by digital downloads. Quite often, we were called to all-hands work details to stuff lecture CDs into their cases so they could be shrink-wrapped and sent out. The thousands and thousands of CDs coming off the line were far more than the staff posted in the area could deal with, so the rest of the org would be called in for half an hour after lunch, for example. One day, Becky and I were standing next to each other while we stuffed CDs when David arrived for an inspection and noticed us. A person in his entourage came over and told Becky she had to move because it was not personal time. Anything to make your life more miserable. Much of what I have written in this chapter is bad enough, but the worst thing is, I am actually telling the truth. It gets even worse, however, but before I dive into that, I have a piece of advice. Do not ever sign away any right you have as an individual. Don't ever sign anything that will allow someone to read your mail or listen to your phone calls or restrict your freedom of movement. If you do, you have allowed the erosion of freedoms that I consider your birthright. You will have started to fashion the key that fits the lock of the mental prison you will find yourself in, and you do not own that key. That's how it starts, so do not do it. If you find yourself in a relationship with another person, group, or institution that begins to try to take away some of your rights, and the situation is too big for you to deal with head-on, Find a side door and get out. Once you are in a safer position, you can take action to disempower that person or group.